Hi, my name is Anna Shen. I cover tech, venture capital, and startups for the Huffington Post. As you know with me, I have Nikunj Jinsi, who is the global head of the venture capital arm of the IFC, managing a billion dollars. Uh, before I start, I'd like to find out a little bit more about the fund and uh, what you're working on. Thanks, Anna. Uh, just want to make sure people can hear me. Um, which seems to be the case. Um, delighted to be here, and thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, <clears throat> as Anna mentioned, I'm Nikun Jinsi. I'm with the International Finance Corporation. We are the private sector investment arm of the World Bank Group, with offices in over 150 countries. Um, our, our main remit is to invest into developing markets. I believe we are the largest uh, investor in emerging markets globally and have been around for over 60 years in doing so. Um, and our shareholder base essentially is uh, many of the country, uh, most of the countries in the world who are shareholders, the US being the largest shareholder, but other developing uh, countries such as China and India uh, and even Japan, which is not a developing country, are large shareholders as well. But we have, we have I believe, well over 100 shareholders as well. Um, within that, I run the, the venture team, and we technically don't have a fund. We invest off our balance sheet. Uh, IFC has a balance sheet over $70 billion, I believe. Um, and our, our efforts within that whole context are modest. So uh, right now, I, uh, the venture play is roughly a billion dollar play, um, largely driven by uh, direct investments. So I act mainly, our, our day job really is uh, to act as a GP. Uh, but we've also off late been investing um, as an LP into fund managers. And so why do we do that? Uh, we have, um, you know, as a GP, we invest directly into companies at a more later stage, so typically Series B and beyond. We've been doing that for 18 years, actually, uh, in, you know, starting out in Asia, but then expanding into other markets, and we'll get into that shortly. Um, and as an LP, what I want to do is to expand my footprint by looking at working with some of the best of breed early stage fund managers that are typically seed and Series A driven to A, uh, expand my footprint, to uh, B, to, uh, to act as a lead generator for future deals we could be looking at jointly. Um, so it's a comprehensive strategy in which we're looking, uh, taking a GP mindset and looking at coming in as an LP, uh, working alongside many of our partners in, in select markets. What do you feel the competitive advantages for IFC? Well, yeah, well, for one, we're actually literally um, not supposed to compete, and, and we, we try not to. But we, uh, what we try and do is co-opt uh, uh, with many, many of people who are in the room and who were on the stage earlier, we are partnered with. So we, uh, we work alongside many of the private sector firms. Literally, the panel that sat on first uh, with GGV Foundation and uh, DST, all of them we've co-invested with, and there's several other people coming on panels after us and, and people in the audience who we have worked with. And that's kind of like you know, our unique strength. We're able to convene uh, parties. Uh, we're not seen to be particularly partisan because of our role. Um, and the other part of our strength is the fact that we have a global purview. So pattern recognition is, uh, is a key part of our, what we do. Um, so for example, we're looking at a lot at the uh, logistics transportation, the e-logistics uh, transportation market now. Um, and there's a lot going on, not just with uh, sort of the Uber side of the market, but also on the two-wheeler side. Uh, and there are different pockets arising in various parts of the world. Uh, you have a company called Gojek in Indonesia, which is now well established as a billion dollar plus unicorn. Um, but you're seeing pockets arise now in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh. And there's patterns out there that could help us, just because we are looking at businesses globally, that could help us better understand what's happening at the nascent stages of these new businesses. Okay, so in terms of trends, tell me some companies that you're excited about and where they're located. Uh, well, we have several companies. So that's one of the, uh, just, just to put it into context, uh, transportation logistics in most developing countries forms around 8 to 15% of the GDP. That's, that's roughly the size of the, uh, the industry you're talking about. Um, and you can imagine in, a, in an economy like China, where we're also quite in, invested into, and I won't get too much into China and India. We're well established on the ground there, but we have a lot of panels speaking out there. Um, but in, in a place like China, you're talking about a trillion dollar industry, and we've invested into a play that looks at long haul trucking, a company called Ho Chi Bang, 
uh, that consolidates among six million truck drivers, consolidates about four and a half million of them on a common platform. Similarly, um, I just got back from Brazil a couple of uh, days ago. We have invested into a, uh, uh, um, a last mile delivery play that uses two wheelers, a company called Logi, uh, which when we invested had less than a thousand drivers, basically uh, uh, young men and women going around on two wheelers delivering food, documents, and, and uh, e-commerce products to, uh, to one's home. A uh, huge problem in many of these countries we talk about. It has a congested infrastructure, uh, uh, not enough funding, not enough budget at the government level to take care of the roads and the infrastructure uh, problems. So effectively what's happening, you're using a big data approach towards solving a real life problem there. So what Logi is doing now with 4,000 drivers is to effectively circumvent the congestion by and guaranteeing hourly or sometimes daily deliveries of particular critical packets. So just curious, a lot of the VCs that I've spoken to in Silicon Valley, they're a little skittish about getting involved in markets that are so far from home where they won't have an opportunity to actually oversee. What are some of the risks that, that investors should look at? Sure. Um, I mean, first off, I would say that look at the um, typically at the um, venture dollars invested by GDP per cap. If you look at that ratio, you'll find out that most developing countries, including China, but more so some of the other countries in Latin America, Middle East, um, uh, Southeast Asia, and even parts of Eastern Europe, are hugely underinvested. And there's a reason they've been traditionally underinvested because there was no ecosystem in play there uh, it was no real early stage startup mechanism there weren't there were no entrepreneurs who could mentor and there were very very few exits we find all of that is changing now it's changing changing gradually well actually it's changing rapidly because you know three years ago i wouldn't be making this kind of statement and now you're seeing much of the development happening in, uh, in many many of these countries so um, are there risks involved in it? Absolutely. Uh, some of them have been spoken about earlier, such as um, uh, macro issues. Uh, I'd refer again to Brazil, where I was. Um, you know, does the country have economic challenges? Absolutely. Uh, is there an overhang for next year's election out there? Absolutely. Does that affect the uh, reais? Well, a little bit. The reais has actually already taken a huge hit, uh, local currency. Um, and people talked about foreign currency risk, which in, in, in the end, uh, one will have to take and one will have to take a view on, uh, either by taking a very long-term view on the macros of the country or by looking at underlying businesses that actually trade more into a mix of currencies and are naturally operationally hedged towards the local currency. So currency risk is, a, is an issue which is linked to macro. Uh, regulatory risk is often a major issue in countries and it depends on the kind of sector one operates in, but it's a major issue. The prior panel was talking about China, but you know, regulatory changes there are, you know, very, very common to, to, to occur, as they are as well as in India. In particular sectors that the government would like to have a bit more uh, hold on. Um, and then you'll have to take a risk on, on the underlying team, which is often a novice team, a first-time team. Uh, they're talking about young entrepreneurs in their 20s who, are, uh, who are, haven't seen role models in the particular country grow up. So they won't have the benefit of mentors guiding them to the country. Um, and one will have to take a risk, uh, take a view out there. And how do you prepare that? I, I, the, you're working with incubators and accelerators to kind of foster that ecosystem also, if I remember correctly. Correct. We, uh, we get involved at all stages of the uh, ecosystem. And, and so how do we look at, you know, as an LP, how do we look at it, uh, at, at, at taking the risk? One, we want to vet the, uh, uh, the underlying GP and the underlying teams for their particular track record and how they operate and behave with their with their companies, which is not all that different from what any LP would look at. Uh, two, we want to hear the views on the long-term opportunities in such country. Um, uh, you know, what what is the uh, what what is the exciting factor? What is the additionality? What is the alpha that they bring? And in many cases, um, we find that in several of the economies, and the reason we are now starting to look at other economies and other parts of the world, we're operating in six continents. In uh, we have investments in over 30 countries now. The reason we're starting to look more actively at countries well outside of Asia is that you know the the whole data-driven approach, the digital economy trend is happening, and it's for real. 
Uh, it's brought down the barriers to entry for new entrepreneurs. For the first time, you're seeing pockets of entrepreneurs develop in places such as Lagos, in, in Accra, in Ghana, in Sao Paulo, in Jakarta. And why is that the case? Because the mobile phone and, and the smartphone has made access to data ubiquitous, has made data-driven businesses easier to develop, uh, has made information sharing easier, so such that you know, we talk about developing Silicon Valleys in other parts of the world. I actually don't think they, you need to develop that because you know, in many cases, these are technology uh, incubation hubs that are developed that are different from Silicon Valley. You will not be looking at high tech and developing research-driven technology in such markets, but you will be looking at applied technologies that are solving a real problem, a real problem in the underlying economy, such that one could potentially leapfrog through deploying uh, digital technologies in particular areas such as education, health, logistics, fintech, clean tech, um, and that whole digitization trend uh, brings, brings with it uh, opportunities. So a lot of the uh, participants today want to partner with IFC. How do they go about that? Most important question. Right? <laughs> well, first off, we, uh, um, you know, there are 30 of us in the main team, and there are uh, 3,000 of us throughout IFC. So we are well established and well reachable just in person through many of our offices. Second, we have a website, ifc.org/vc. Um, but more often than not, um, a, um, uh, a warm introduction through people who we work with. And we have a fairly vibrant portfolio, a fairly large investor network we, uh, we deal with. Uh, more often than not, uh, a warm introduction works better than a, than a cold call uh, uh, for you know, a variety of reasons. I think uh, many of the entrepreneurs or many of the, the LPs and the GPs could, would tell you the same. Um, and it's important to note that you know, while we look at, at businesses uh, on one hand from a hard-nosed sustainability perspective to see if they are commercially viable, uh, the developmental impact is equally important for us. Um, we are not an impact investor, but we are looking at making investments in funds, fund managers, and direct companies uh, with using both lenses. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what are the next great opportunities out there that you're seeing? Well, first, I think uh, I, mean, I think it's an exciting time right now to be to be uh, to be young and vibrant and to, to start new businesses. They are um, um, uh, geographically, I think there are many new opportunities happening in several of the markets I mentioned, and it's driven by underlying trends. So, favorable demographics, young population that is more and more tech savvy, uh, universities that are now churning out like fairly technology uh, driven, uh, well, good engineers really. Um, and the fact, again, that with the mobile internet, the barriers to enter and the barriers to start new businesses have come down significantly. Um, uh, the, it is much easier today for someone to develop uh, the next two-wheeler uh, ride-sharing business in Pakistan or in Dhaka, Bangladesh, which actually is happening, than it was four or five years ago. And it's all got to do with the fact that data-driven solutions is now getting more and more accepted. Uh, the second thing is that we are uh, seeing a lot more happening now domestically in markets uh, for, part, part of it is driven by local governments, part of it is driven by corporates. Uh, we find the Googles and the GEs and the Facebooks actually going back and investing a lot now in setting up little incubation hubs in some of the markets I, I, uh, I talked about. So there's a lot of investment happening now in developing the new age digital entrepreneurs. And then lastly, sector-wise, uh, while I say that a lot of the high-tech development is happening here, we're actually seeing a lot happening also elsewhere in de developing markets. There's fairly cool AI stuff happening now, not just in China, which is, again, pretty hot, uh, but robotics data analytics stuff, that uh, data analytics play we have in, uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, we're about to invest in a company in Africa called Africa's Talking, uh, which is the equivalent of a local Twilio developing API and API libraries that effectively act as a tool that, and uh, working alongside large partners such as telcos, that enables uh, uh, new budding entrepreneurs to set up their businesses much cheaper than they normally would, uh, would have to uh, uh, invest in. Why? Because they're having access to API libraries and are able to rent uh, much of the technology and the facilities that they normally would have to build or buy themselves. Uh, 
so you're seeing a lot of, and this, we're talking here about Nairobi, Kenya, so not, not about Silicon Valley. And so you're seeing a lot of these trends happening by people who are either re returnees and are seeing the, uh, 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 the effect of what has happened in places like China and India. And in a way, many of these markets are China minus 10 or China minus 15, where you know, the market may not be all, uh, that big as China, no, no market in the world is. But there is there's strong opportunities. There's relatively less competition there from, from the entrepreneurial side as well as from the venture side because there's just not that much venture dollars going around there. But there's definitely, and there are exits happening, and there's definitely money to be made. Great. Well, I think that's about all we have time for. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Anna.